okay. to go to the Supreme Court. The fact that we're having to invoke the possibility of using elections uh, to yet again show that people want to choose on this country's future is not where we need to be. I'd far rather the UK government just respected the Scottish electorate, respected the, um, the election result okay. in the majority of the Scottish Parliament, and as good Democrats, as Democrats, abide by democratic standards. Unfortunately, the Conservatives, okay. and now sadly also okay. the Labour Party, are perfectly happy to discard Scottish democracy, and it's not good enough. OK. Angus Robertson, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. Now, train services across the country are returning to normal this morning, but already other key workers are threatening widespread strike action. The Royal College of Nursing has sent ballot papers to 300,000 members across the UK, the largest vote it's ever called. The college says that nurses are understaffed, undervalued and underpaid. With us this morning is Pat Cullen, the RCN's General Secretary and Chief Executive. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Um, before we talk about the strike, where have, we actually, where have you actually got to in the negotiations? Um, well, put simply, um, we aren't in negotiations. I have made many attempts on behalf of not just the 300,000 nurses that have been balloted, but the 500,000 plus nurses that I represent. And unfortunately, this government hasn't engaged with the Royal College of Nursing as yet. When you say they haven't in, engaged, and, and uh, do you mean that you've asked for a meeting and um, whoever happened to be health secretary at the time said, no, I'm not talking to you? Well, the last uh, health secretary that I'd contact with was Sajid Javid. And since then, we have made multiple attempts to try and engage with the health secretary. Um, the two, uh, the current one and the previous one that was very short lived. Uh, and both of those people have not um, as yet met with the Royal College of Nursing. Uh, but presumably the, the actual employer here anyway is not Therese Coffey, who's now the health secretary, but the NHS. Presumably you are talking to NH NHS managers. Of course we're talking and, to... And where NHS. have you got to with them? Well, of course, the NHS managers will say very clearly to me that it's not within their gift to um, negotiate with me on pay for their employees, which are our nurses. Uh, so I'm bounced back to government. And that's right. That's absolutely right. Those employers do not have the authority uh, to actually negotiate because Agenda for Change sits at... Um, which is the pay framework for our nursing staff sits within the domain of government to make those decisions. What, um, what is it that you want? Um, what, what is your sort of central demand? Well, first of all, for nurses to be paid a fair and decent wage. That's what we're asking for. And our ask is 5% above the rate of inflation. That's very clear. It's not about nurses um, being greedy. Uh, it's not about wanting the same um, preferential treatment that was given to the bankers and others by this government. We're asking for them to be pay paid a fair and decent wage so that we can retain them in the health service looking after our patients. Well, um, let's leave the bankers aside because they're not paid by the government. They're not paid by the taxpayer. 5% uh, above inflation this morning is 14.9%. That's quite a hefty rise. Well, Trevor, you did mention the bankers, but if you looked, and um, of course we attended the Conservative Party conference, and we listened very carefully to what they say, and it does seem that those people, like bankers and others, are very carefully looked after. What we have seen very clearly from this government is that they haven't managed to actually recognise that they cannot have a health service without nurses. We heard this morning from ministers coming on this programme and talking about how they're going to deliver on their A's, their B's, their C's and their D's. And what I want to say to each and every one of them, they'll deliver on none of those if they do not understand there's an N in the alphabet, because each one of those depend on nurses. We deliver nothing in health and social care without having a nurse. And yet they have just seemed to not understand that they need to understand that there's an N in the alphabet and they need to respect nurses if they want to retain them in the health service. If we can stop our nurses having to leave 
the health service and indeed social care to find jobs in supermarkets, in restaurants and other places that they can pay their bills. I think that's an incredible indictment on any minister to sit here and not actually recognise what they are doing to the health service and to patients. Do you, um, are you getting any more mileage, if I can put it that way, from the devolved administrations? Uh, Scotland is a separate negotiation, I, I guess, as it would be Northern Ireland. Well, certainly in Scotland, there was a higher percentage um, pay award um, uh, granted this time around. It certainly didn't come anywhere near uh, what nurses require in order to make a decent living. Um, this isn't, they're not asking for, um, as I've said, golden handshakes out of this. They're not. They're asking for a decent living wage. Um, they're not getting that. So no government, and of course we know the situation in Northern Ireland, so we'll not go there. But as yet, none of the devolved administrations have come up to the standard that we expect them to for our nursing staff. So you'll be going back to the Scots and Stormont when, it, when there is a government in Stormont when there is such a thing. Um, and saying that nurses need a bit more? We've already done that, yes. And of course, in those 300,000 ballot papers that went out, they went out right across the UK, not just in England. Well, let's talk about what that uh, means. Um, we don't have any experience of a nurses' strike. How would that work? I mean, what if you walk out, what happens to patients who are in intensive care, patients who are going to be dehydrated, patients mm -hmm. who need... Mm -hmm. Uh, their dressings changed? OK. Well, actually, we do have um, experience of a nurse's strike. Um, and I had the privilege, but actually the sadness of leading the first nurse's strike in the 103 years history of this college in late 2019-2020 in Northern Ireland, when we actually had no government. Um, and during that time, what I would say to each person and member of the public listening this morning, our nursing staff, and I am a nurse of 42 years, will never walk away from you. And during that strike in Northern Ireland, we did not walk out on our patients. Uh, we made sure our patients were still cared for. Now, of course, there will be disruption because the clue is in the title. It is about withdrawal of labour. Uh, but we still continue to provide uh, um, life-preserving services during that time. And there are certain ser services that we will absolutely never withdraw labour from. But... but what action would you say? Because, uh, in a way, you, if I may put it this way, you can't have it both ways. You can't say that we are going to hold the government's feet to the fire, but actually, if it becomes difficult for anybody, we're going to look after them. Well, there's life-preserving services that we will always continue to provide because we are a regulated profession. We will absolutely not just down tools and leave our patients and abandon them. We haven't done it to date um, and we'll not do it now. We certainly will not. Um, but there will be a withdrawal of nursing staff and we have very clear um, clinical protocols in place about how we manage that on a day of a strike, about the number of staff that will remain to provide services for our patients and those that will then, obviously, that you will see, should the time come, um, that will be, be seen on picket lines. And that will be managed very carefully and very safely. And the other thing that I will say, that during the strike in Northern Ireland, which lasted for eight days, um, and again, if our nurses' ballot um, for strike action in any of our, our UK countries as we move forward in November. Uh, we will cause no further or additional risk to patients that's already created as a consequence of this government turning their back on nursing as we stand. Well, if I may, can I be specific about this? Will midwives, for example, be involved in this action? In Northern Ireland, we certainly didn't withdraw midwives um, at the time of our strike action. No, we didn't. And the nurses? Um, with, with ambulances waiting three, four, five, six, seven, eight? And yes, and I go back hours. to the point that I made in the A, the B, the C and the D. None of those will be, will, will be delivered, absolutely not. And why do we see those ambulances queued up at the minute? We see them queued up because there's not the nursing staff to look after those patients that are in the backs of those ambulances. And what an indictment on a society to actually keep patients, our elderly patients, in the backs of ambulances simply because we have turned our back on nursing staff. Um, and finally, if I may ask briefly, what will you do if the government says we're going to treat nurses like police officers and make it unlawful for them to strike? Well, we heard a lot this morning about democracy, didn't we? And this is the democratic right of the worker 
to actually, first of all, belong to a trade union and then have representation. And why are we representing our nurses? Because there's no government speaking up for them at the minute. And again, that would be another nail in the coffin for this government to say that they're actually going to silence the workers, the people at the front line, the clinical staff looking after patients day and daily. So I think that would be a very sad day if we moved to that position. And certainly our Royal College of Nursing will have something to say about it. Pat Carlin, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, some of Britain's leading supermarkets are stepping in to help staff and customers cope with the cost of living crisis. Sainsbury's offering its staff extra pay rises and free food. Asda's gone even further, selling anyone over 60 a bowl of soup, a roll and unlimited tea and coffee for just £1 in its cafes in November and December. I'm ready. So, are supermarkets the right people to help the poorest in society cope this winter? We're joined by the former chief executive of Sainsbury's, Justin King. Good morning, Justin. Good morning, Trevor, and I'm one of those over 60s too, so it's... Uh, you <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll see you down there. Um, look, we're, we're saying supermarkets <laughs> taking these actions, special deals, explicitly aimed... Uh, at people to help people in tough economic circumstances. Um, one, as the I think it is providing warm spaces for people. Uh, do you support all of that? Well, I've worked for ASDA, uh, Sainsbury's. Uh, I'm a director of Marks & Spencer's now, and uh, it's been my working life. So, yes, I, I do. I think supermarkets have always taken very seriously the role that they play in helping their customers, uh, if you like, make ends meet. And the challenge hasn't been as great as this until, uh, well, since you and I were <laughs> a lot younger. I can remember the 1970s, which is probably the last time the challenges <laughs> for households were as great. Um, and they will play what part they can. You have to remember, of course, that supermarkets typically make uh, only about 3% profit. So you know, even if they invested, say, half of their uh, potential profits in this kind of activity, it's only going to make a small dent, but an important dent, I would suggest, on the challenges of you know, nearly 10% inflation that you've just been discussing. But uh, I, I suppose a question that will occur to many people is whether this is really supermarkets business. And let me put it uh, this way. Um, the big shareholders in most British supermarket uh, chains are also, for example, pension funds, and they expect a return. Is it really right for supermarkets to be doing a job that really is for the social services uh, and endangering the returns uh, for pensioners? Well, I said they're playing their part. And, of course, what they're really doing is competing. They're fighting for customers. You know, when times are challenging, uh, customers do shop around a bit more. So um, if you wanted to be cynical, of course, you could say that these are just marketing activities aimed at capturing new customers. So I don't see any kind of logical disconnect, if you like, between this kind of activity and supermarkets doing the right thing for their shareholders too. Of course, only uh, two of our supermarkets are now uh, publicly listed companies, the big ones uh, anyway, Sainsbury's and Tesco. Uh, others are privately held or held by uh, big worldwide chains. Um, I, I frankly don't think you should worry too much. I don't think customers to worry too much about shareholders being looked after. That's the job of management, along with making sure they do a great job for customers. Because in the long run, the right thing for shareholders is doing the right thing for customers. OK, well, I, I suppose the, uh, I read the, the, earlier this week that um, Waitrose has its thermal underwear flying off the shelves. And I, I suppose some people might wonder whether the, the real answer here is for supermarkets to be pricing their uh, normal goods even more competitively because that will help uh, a wider range of people rather than what to some people might look like a bit of a gimmick. Well, as I said, you know, the cynical might say it's just a marketing uh, activity, but it doesn't mean it's a bad thing to do. Uh, yes, of course, across the piece, they'll need to keep their prices sharp. If you're not uh, competitive on price at the moment and more and more customers are focusing on price, then you're going to be in trouble competitively. So I think they'll be doing that too. But as I said that earlier, you know, they haven't got massive profit percentages. They can make a dent uh, uh, in uh, the uh, inflation that customers will experience on their grocery shop and you mentioned Waitrose and Thermals, that'll be in John Lewis, and of course Marks and Spencer has a big clothing business 
to uh, keeping clothes competitive, particularly those we use to wrap up warm as we uh, enter winter, uh, that will be part of the competition too. Is there a danger here, though? That, I mean, this is all. This all sounds, whether it's marketing gimmick or not, it's going to benefit some people. I don't think anybody will object to that. But there is a danger that what's happening here is that the government gets uh, let off the hook uh, because next week a minister will come in here and say to Sophie, honestly, you know, don't expect us to do too much, uh, and everybody's pitching in. Look at what the supermarkets are doing; they're helping. Well, have a chat with Sophie and tell her not to let them off that hook. Uh, obviously, uh, everyone should play their part and supermarkets will do because it's a competitive market. But you spent most of this programme discussing one way or another uh, what difference the government can make. Uh, we've seen on energy prices a very significant and costly uh, support package. But we should remember every single pound the government spends is our money still. Uh, we'll have to pay it back through taxes or perhaps more likely our children and grandchildren paying it back through taxes. So I don't think either we should be uh, overly blasé about the amount of money the government's uh, spending. You know, personally, I think it should be more targeted and less blanket. I think those of us that can afford, and I'm very fortunate to be one of those people, to pay my bills uh, for the energy, even at these high levels, I think we should uh, pay our full bills, and that would leave more money for the most needy. And I personally believe um, much government activity would be better if it were targeted. Does that mean, um, I mean, you, you've been in charge of some of the biggest enterprises in this country with millions of consumers and so on, uh, so you do follow their behaviours pretty closely. Um, from that point of view, do you think that what the Chancellor did and the way he approached the issue of dealing with cost of living um, was essentially the wrong approach from what you've just said about targeting it suggests that you think that uh, they could have done better well uh, look the i think we now officially call it a mini uh, budget was uh, argued to be necessary because the issues it addressed were urgent and some of those issues uh, fuel prices for winter were clearly urgent but others of the issues some of the tax changes you've been discussing were not urgent and i think that as much as anything is what uh, spook the markets with the consequences that it's going to have for people's household budgets with inflation and interest rates, of course. Um, but yes, as a general rule, I don't think the government should be giving money to those uh, people who uh, can afford to pay their bills so it can give more money to those who are going to struggle. I think targeting is perfectly possible, uh, initially through the benefit system, uh, but through some kinds of means testing. And I also they should think there should be a limit to the help the government provides. Um, you know, long before uh, this cost of living crisis arrived, we were discussing uh, the carbon uh, crisis and yeah. higher energy prices, higher fuel prices, we're all driving our cars less because of how expensive petrol and diesel is. That's a good thing if you take the long view. It may be painful to household budgets in the short term, but we have to have a different relationship with energy. We, as a society, okay. so... I would not provide an unlimited uh, support. I would make sure that everyone's able to keep themselves warm and fed. Uh, but ultimately, we have to pay a higher price for energy going forward. Admirably clear as always, Justin. Thanks very much for joining us this, this morning. Thank you. Well, that's it uh, for this week's Sophie Ridge on Sunday. It's been fun to be back, if only for one morning. After the break, we'll run through today's interviews and see what we've learned. And I'll be joined by our political correspondent, Rob Powell, for The Take. Thanks for joining us this Sunday morning. Stay with us.